Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I, I'll begin by just trying to respond to a couple of the questions that have come in. Um, one is to, uh, a, a request for clarification of what I said as one of the characteristics of inner freedom that I uh, mentioned was not by, uh, that it was not attained by effort. And uh, this person asked me to clarify uh, what I mean by that. And I, I think uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that it's not so much about uh, determining to um, uh, to reorder and change our lives. Uh, it's uh, sometimes that effort is is further uh, uh, further action and effort by the ego isn't necessarily what we need. Um, sometimes uh, I think this has uh, has a much more um, natural um, uh, feeling to it. It's not so much striving to change something, to make goals, to resolve to be different, to to make resolutions, and to you know, to, I'm going to be better. It's it's more of a natural unfolding when we come to see uh, how we've been entrapped. That awareness will cause some of this to fall away very easily and gently. And I go back to my illustration about just in that hotel room, just coming to the awareness of what I was afraid of, why I was anxious, why I was feeling what I was, it just, it melted away. And uh, it, uh, it, it didn't involve uh, making a resolution or, or figuring I have to change myself somehow. Simply the awareness caused it to fall away. And I think that's much more the way that this comes about. It's kind of an organic thing that when we see how we've been uh, captivated by this um, false belief or this false assumption uh, that... Uh, uh, the power of that uh, is suddenly that thing loses its power over us. And um, um, that doesn't, uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's clarifying or not, but that's about the best I can do, I think. Um, there's another question about just saying that, uh, you know, there's this innate uh, drawing in each of us to unite with a, another person, to marry, to create family and things like that. and. Uh, how that can be difficult to separate from the call to be one with God. And um, uh, uh, so a few words of wisdom on that dynamic. I think some of that uh, we'll touch on in this next session because I want to talk about healthy and unhealthy forms of love. And when we're entering into a relationship with someone, uh, and committing ourselves to uh, uh, someone, um, uh, creating a family perhaps with someone, uh, we're definitely uh, forming an attachment. But how can that be a healthy attachment and not an unhealthy attachment? And um, how does that attachment, when it's lived in freedom, still allow us to love God above all? You know, um, uh, so it... Uh, well, I think we'll try to get into that, and I'll see if I can answer that in the context of the next um, uh, portion. Um, and uh, an, another question uh, uh, similar to that is how clinging to attachments can affect a relationship or uh, a marriage that is experiencing difficulties. And, and uh, we may... Uh, we may uh, hit on some of that too in this next session. So I, I think what I'll do is just plunge into this next session and there will be another time at the end for some of these questions to reemerge. So if I haven't, um, I haven't answered your question and what I'm about to say, then um, please raise it again and I'll give it another shot. <laughs> I still consider myself as kind of an elementary school teacher. <laughs> I taught little deaf kids, and so things were things had to be plain and simple, not too complicated. And uh, so I'm trying to make make some of this 
uh, simple and accessible for you. But uh, the risk the risk is that we, you know, we deny the complexity of some of these these things. Uh, some of these situations are are complex, but uh, I still think that understanding these principles will help us to move toward uh, the freedom that we were intended to enjoy as children of God. I have an image about children who are happy in their homes. If they're, if they're growing up in a secure environment with parents who love them and who support them and who affirm them and allow them to be who they are and allow them to become who they're going to become, um, that there is a kind of a glorious freedom that children can experience. Think of a happy child who is free to express uh, himself or herself and who, who feels right at home in this environment, is not afraid of, of uh, being pounced on or beaten or criticized or abused or uh, humiliated. Uh, and it lives into a kind of glorious freedom. And I think that's the kind of freedom that uh, God wants for us to, that's the freedom of a, that a good parent wants to see. Uh, in the children. Uh, and when I was teaching, I hoped to have that freedom even in, in the children that I taught. I wanted them to feel secure in the classroom and feel like they could express their ideas or ask their questions and, and they wouldn't be belittled or, or uh, embarrassed or humiliated. And, uh, uh, and I wanted them to feel free uh, in, in the setting and so that they could really thrive. Um, and uh, I, I believe that God is a good parent and wants these things for us too. Um, I, I don't believe that God wants us cowering in the corner, uh, frightened to death of what God might do to us if we're not good enough or if we, <laughs> uh, I, I just don't think that's an accurate image of God, not the God that has been revealed to us by Jesus. Jesus was all about love. Um, he taught love. He, he acted in love. Even sometimes when he spoke harsh words, I'm convinced that they were spoken in love. It's like he's taking some of these Pharisees by the lapels and shaking them and saying, listen, <laughs> You are in bondage yourself, and you're causing other people to be in bondage, and that's a serious matter. But the, the words are spoken in love. He's trying to get their attention, trying to help them see how they've been harming people by their expectations and the weight of their laws. So I, I think um, Jesus' message is love, his being is love. Um, he came into the world because God so loved the world and he came to encourage us to love and to know ourselves to be loved. First John 3 verse 1, one of my favorite verses, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God and that is what we are. What love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Beloved, since God has loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. So Jesus came to teach us to love, to teach us uh, that we, we are loved, to uh, join us together in a community of love, um, it's all about love. The gospel boils down to just that message of love. Now, I want to contrast two kinds of love. Uh, now, one, one is a love that seeks to possess or that clings. And sometimes this, uh, this notion uh, this kind of clingy, dependent love, this possessive love, is even encouraged in our culture. Um, and think of some of the 
so romantic uh, songs in which someone sings their laments that, you know, uh, how could I live without you? <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, you are my all in all. And, and this kind of, uh, kind of, I need this person so much. <laughs> um, uh, what would I do without you? Uh, kind of love. We, we see it negatively expressed, this kind of possessive clinging love. Um, sometimes tragically in the news where someone breaks up with their boyfriend and then he becomes a stalker or, um, or someone is so disappointed that uh, their partner has broken off with them that they, they kill them or kill uh, the third person involved or kill themselves even. Uh, lead to violent. Uh, that, that kind of love is not real love. The person can talk about how much I love this person and I'm so devastated that they leave me that I have to end my life or I have to end their life or something. They can talk about how much love, them, but it's not real love that they're talking about. They're talking about possession, about, about clinging. They're talking about a disordered detachment. We see, like, for example, a husband who loves his wife so much that he always wants her to be home. <laughs> and he gets angry or jealous or suspicious when she wants to go out or when she wants to have the develop friendships with others. That's a possessive, clinging love. No, we have to always be together. You have to always be mine. You always have to be with me. I can't... Uh, I can't risk having you go out and develop friendships and a sense of independence on your own. Sometimes we see this kind of possessive love in, in, in uh, maybe a person who is desperate to be married and they find someone, they cling to that person, almost suffocating them um, by their possessiveness. Um, uh, their, their whole happiness and their whole future is bound up in this person. And so they have to control, they have to possess, they have to, they, they cling and, uh, and they lose their sense of their own personhood. Um, a psychologist once explained to me that, you know, if you imagine two people and each one is an entity in themselves. And they come together in a healthy relationship. They stay, uh, they are still complete persons, but they join together mutually in, uh, in, in a bond of love. He said the unhealthy thing looks more like this, where the two people have come together, but they their identities have kind of, melded and overlapped into one. So this, this, they feel that there's a kind of a clinginess, a possessiveness that uh, they lose their sense of their individual self and, uh, it, and uh, something becomes distorted. So a, a couple that can never be apart or that can never have friendships outside of the marriage um, is, is, and uh, there's a couple that is, is at risk of this kind of possessive, clingy love. I think of it uh, when you have a friend who's possessive. I, I remember one time a, a, I had dinner arrangements with a friend and I had to cancel. And I called up and, and the response was, was so hostile. He said, like, well, why, why don't you change your plans and so that you can be with me, you promised to be with me. And it was, um, it was surprising. Uh, he, uh, he took it as an insult and a threat that I would, that something else had come up for me. And he said, I'm not important enough to you. Uh, you won't change your plans to be with me. And, and I said, well, I, I can't, avoid it. I'm not saying that this friendship is unimportant. 
uh, I have another friend who I had an arrangement with and, and I had to cancel. He said, that's fine. Let's just put our calendars together. We'll find another date. Not the least bit threatened, not angry, not, um, not defensive, not critical. Yeah, and look at those two responses to the exact same thing. One is this person is allowing me to be in the relationship in freedom, but this person almost wants to possess me as a friend and is threatened if I don't meet their expectations. So it, there's a kind of unhealthiness that creeps into these relationships when it becomes overly possessive. And this, this kind of love, which is not free, which is a love that is imposing bondage, uh, results in a, in a cycle, like alluded to before, of attraction, of pleasure, and of attachment, of some fulfillment and satisfaction, but also some fear and anxiety jealousy, possessiveness, sadness, pain, a kind of roller coaster of emotions when we try to possess or control the other. And so we contrast that kind of possessive, clingy, controlling love with the kind of love that we enter into with someone that is a love that allows both people to live in freedom. This is a love that forgets itself, that is steadfast and stable and reliable, but is not possessive or clingy or restrictive. It's a love without this kind of disordered attachment, a love that's not uh, rooted in fear of, of loss or of change, uh, not threatened by change or by, uh, uh, by the evolution of the relationship. So, um, it's a love that is demonstrated by caring and by sharing, but not by controlling. Uh, um, this, this is a love, a healthy love that promotes a kind of equanimity, a sense of things are all right, no matter what, we'll get through this, we're committed to one another, but um, uh, we're, we're prepared to face the world together and share in a life together, but we're not threatened uh, um, by uh, things that can come into our life. Um, maybe you have some experience of this. Maybe you can recall uh, a friendship or a relationship that you've had that felt unfree to you, that you felt, you experienced it as a kind of bondage or captivity. This other person wanted to possess you or to control you in some ways. And so sometimes this love for a particular person or partner or spouse or a child or a friend or a parent can be a possessive clinging love uh, that uh, demands its, its own way, that wants to possess this person that uh, loses its identity in this person and uh, wants this person to lose their identity in, in them. It's a needy kind of love, um, a clinging kind of love. And it's threatened by change or by uh, uh, growth. Um, it, 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 be, it becomes a kind of shallow and a fearful kind of love. And the contrast to that is that love that is free, that forgets itself, that is uh, stable and steadfast, but not restrictive, that uh, shares with the other, that uh, uh, enjoys the commitment, but, but doesn't insist on uh, constantly being with this person or constantly uh, uh, being joined to this person, is free to in, enjoy other people and to, uh, uh, to have other friendships as well. 
uh, Anthony DeMello, maybe some of you have read some of his works, uh, also a Jesuit and uh, born in India. So he has an interesting take that uh, he is able to speak about this uh, detachment uh, from a Jesuit perspective about freedom from in disordered attachments and inordinate loves and from an Eastern perspective, which also has a kind of a strain of uh, the importance of being detached in freedom from, from things. And uh, he talks about love and talks about three characteristics of love. The first he says is love is indiscriminate. In other words, uh, a person who is loving exudes love. <laughs> no matter where they go or no matter who they, they meet. And he, he says, uh, consider the rose. A rose gives off its fragrance uh, to whoever comes uh, uh, in it, into its presence. It doesn't uh, decide this, to give its fragrance to this person and not to this person. It simply is fragrant and so its fragrance is available and offered to all or imagine a lamp that is giving off light it doesn't discriminate between this person it doesn't give light to this person but not to this person it's not it's simply its nature is to give light and that light is available to all and he says love is like this love is indiscriminate and so um in, instead of thinking, well, I, I love, I love this person. I don't love this person. I love this person, but I don't love this person. Instead of that kind of discrimination, we, we say, rather than deciding who I love and who I don't love, I simply want to be loved, so that whoever comes into my presence experiences love and uh, experiences. Uh, uh, the things that come with love, the sense of dignity and respect. Um, Jesus taught us to love even our enemies, um, to want the, what is good for them and to want what God wants for them. Um, and so love that is indiscriminate, it's the kind of love that Jesus talks about when he says, you know, the, the sun shines on the good and the evil. The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. God isn't a discriminating God, doesn't just send uh, sunshine or rain to just the people that are good enough to deserve it. God's love is abundant and given to all. Love is indiscriminate. And then he says, secondly, love is gratuitous. It, it gives and asks nothing in return. It's not, uh, and we, we recognize this, don't we? We're very suspicious of someone who's, uh, let's say a man whose choice of a, life, of a wife is determined uh, not by any quality that she might have, but by the amount of money that she'll bring in. <laughs> Or conversely, a, a woman who marries someone, not for the person that they are, but for the, for the wealth and the privilege that they can bring them. So that's a kind of um, a love that is seeking something in return. But uh, DeMello is suggesting that love is gratuitous, that is freely given. And, uh, and so... We love not only this person who's special to us and who we have a tendency to uh, want to cling to and hold on to, but we love every person because each person is, uh, is created in the image of God. We simply are love and we offer this love to everyone, uh, not expecting uh, uh, to uh, have a certain return or a certain response. We're simply, we are love rather than we are dispensing love to different people in different amounts. We simply are love, like that old Jesuit who radiated joy and love 
everyone who came into his presence. So it's like coming into the light or coming up to the rose and enjoying its fragrance. And love is unselfconscious. It's almost, a love is blissfully unaware of itself, says De Mello. The lamp shines and the rose gives its fragrance without thought of benefiting others. There is nothing else it can do. It's natural for a rose to give off fragrance. It's natural for a lamp to give off light. And uh, they're not produced at the approach of persons or turned off when there's no one there. These things, like love, exist independently of persons. Love simply is. It has no object. It doesn't try to possess. It doesn't discriminate. They simply are. And so to love means to live with a kind of sensitivity and openness and appreciation of others. Um, whether this person is someone that we're naturally attracted to or not, um, God calls us just to be channels of love in the world. When new brothers come to the community, we usually give them a warning that there will be someone in the community that will be their special teacher, someone that's going to get under their skin, that something about this person is going to drive them crazy. And uh, most of us know what it's like to have a person like that in our life, someone who just uh, grates us and who we find an irritant and we say, this brother will be your special teacher because if you learn to respond to him in love, you will grow in patience and in long suffering, in humility, in graciousness. Um, you will find yourself developing all of these virtues if you can learn to respond to him in love and to appreciate who he is and to set aside the things that are irritating to see him as a child of God. It will be a, a fertilizer to help you grow virtue. And this person is a gift to you, uh, even though they may not seem like a gift uh, in the moment. How do we become love? How do we uh, live in love? I, I think the key is um, in First John, it says we love because he first loved us. So part of the way to become loving people is to absorb and take into ourselves the love that is being offered to us from God through Christ and to take that love into the deepest part of ourselves, let it soak into us so that we know ourselves beyond any doubt that we are loved, that we have been given this free, uh, gratuitous gift of love from the one who is love. And uh, we love because God first loved us. We take this love into ourselves and then we're able to give it to others. We realize that God hasn't condemned us. God has been gracious and, and overlooked our, uh, all our shortcomings and faults, our selfishness, our pride. And God says, I love you anyway, just the way you are. And once we re re we've been loved without judgment, we can love others without judgment. We can let go of our judgments. And... Uh, and, and see them as persons worthy of love. Once we've been forgiven, we can forgive others. Once we've been accepted, we can accept others uh, without judgment, without condemnation. Uh, just as God has uh, loved us, we can love others. One of the stories that I love from the Gospels, it might be my favorite Gospel story, is the story of the woman who was a sinner 
in Luke chapter 7. We read about this woman who was a sinner. Jesus is at that table with a Pharisee in the Pharisee's home. He's accepted an invitation to supper. And this woman comes in, who the gospel writer tells us was a sinner. We don't know what kind of sinner she was or how uh, seeing her we might have discerned that she was a sinner. We don't even know what it means to be a sinner. The, the, the definition of sinner was quite broad in Jesus' day. A sinner could be just simply a non-observant Jew, someone who wasn't keeping kosher. And so it's a fairly broad definition, but she was recognized as a, as a sinner. And the host, Jesus' host, the Pharisee, drew back from her. He didn't want her there. He resented her presence. And especially when she approached Jesus and touched him and anointed him with ointment and with her tears, the Pharisee was offended. And then there's this powerful question in the story. I don't know if you've ever seen it. If you haven't seen it, read it in, uh, uh, in Luke chapter 7, um, beginning at verse 36. Read the story again. There's a powerful question that he asked. Jesus turns to the Pharisee and he says, Simon, he says, do you see this woman? I love that question because there's no doubt that he's seen him. He's reacted negatively. She, she walked right in the middle of his party, entered his home uh, without his invitation and uh, began to touch this uh, holy man in inappropriate ways that were offensive to the Pharisee. Um, but Jesus says, Simon, do you see this woman? And we get the sense that Simon is not actually seeing this woman. He, Simon is seeing the label that he's affixed to her, that she's a sinner. And because she's a sinner, that has dictated how Simon believes he should respond to her. A holy man would not allow a sinner to uh, come into his home or to touch him or to interact with him. He would keep himself apart from such people. And Jesus is saying, you are responding to her according to the label that you've affixed to her. You see her only as a sinner because she's wearing that label. But now he says, uh, you've missed her because he says, you see this woman, she's been so hospitable to me, so loving. And she came bearing these expensive ointments and she's, uh, she's been so gracious. She's been far more hospitable than you've been. She's a model to you. Yeah, you're not seeing her. To say nothing of her courage and coming to this place where she knew Jesus would be and where she wasn't welcome or invited. But coming anyway because she had to make this expression of love and adoration to him. Simon, do you see this woman? And the truth is that we often don't see one another because we are so quick to attach labels to one another. And part of this invitation to love in the way that God loves indiscriminately and gratuitously and unselfconsciously, part of the invitation is to try to peel back the label that we've affixed to this person and to see the person, to really see them as they are. And not just as we've judge them to be or assume them to be or label them to be. And so um, withholding our judgments, being slow to judge and, uh, and quick to listen, to uh, 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 receive uh, what we can from this person. There's a, um, a lovely story about Dorothy Day that maybe some of you have heard me quote before. And as Dorothy Day was writing in her by uh, uh, Robert Coles, the, the psychologist that, that used to be at Harvard University, wrote a biography of Dorothy Day. And in the, in the preface of this biography, the opening 
part of the biography tells a story about how he met Dorothy Day. He had corresponded with her and asked her if she would be willing to be the subject of his uh, writing project. He would like to write her biography, tell her story. And she agreed to it. And so she invited him to come down to New York to meet her. She was living at the Catholic Worker House on the Lower East Side. And so he went there and uh, he came to the place and uh, 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 was invited in. And he says he saw Dorothy Day at the other side of the room and she was talking with a woman who was obviously intoxicated probably a woman who lived uh, in the streets, uh, poverty, who had problems with addiction and perhaps alcoholism, but she was completely intoxicated. And Dorothy Day was trying to have this conversation with her. And she would ask a question and the woman would go off on some crazy tangent and, uh, and, um, um, and carry on and on. And then uh, she would gradually die down and Dorothy would ask her another question and we'd get the same kind of crazy madness in response. And then uh, Dorothy Day uh, noticed Robert Cole standing there uh, uh, across the room. And so she excused herself from the presence of the woman. She said, excuse me. She came over to talk to Robert Coles and she said, uh, are you waiting to speak with one of us? And I find that such a powerful story, you know, um, and showing the kind of humility that she had and the kind of respect that she had for the people that she ministered to and with. Are you waiting to speak with one of us? You may have come to see this woman or you may have come to me. I don't know. Uh, are you? Uh, she holds this woman in kind of equal regard and, and with respect and dignity, even though the woman's present condition isn't one of dignity. Um, to be slow to judge, to be slow to label, to try to see people, uh, uh, to appreciate the mystery of, the, of a person and not to think that we have somehow penetrated that mystery and that we know who this person is and we can we can therefore judge uh, judge them favorably or unfavorably. So part of our challenge is to widen the circle of our love and to identify those people that we find difficult to love. You know, people who bear a certain label that's a negative label for us. Maybe for some people it's Republicans and other people it's Democrats or for some people it's uh, gay people or for other people, it's people of color or whoever it is, where, wherever we find ourselves with labels that hinder us from seeing people and from loving them uh, just as they are, to peel back those labels and to take a fresh look at them. And this applies also to ourselves because many of us have labels for ourselves names that we use to speak to ourselves, sometimes derogatory or cruel names. Sometimes we're harder on ourselves than we're harder and than we are on other people. We would, we would say things about ourselves that we would never say about someone else. And so, there I go again, I'm so stupid. I'm so clumsy, I never get this right, you know, I'm such a, I'm, I'm so this or that or the other thing. We've got labels that we've attached to ourselves. And, um, and they, they need to be peeled back so that we can look at ourselves with fresh eyes and to see ourselves without judgment and to um, realize that we are loved just as we are. Just as we are. God isn't waiting for you to get it all together. God isn't waiting for you to be very, very holy before God uh, decides to love you. God has said, I already love you. Yeah. I love you. And uh, nothing will take away my love for you. I will never stop, no matter what you do or don't do. You, you have my love. And so we, we can give up the need to uh, strive for God's love 
simply accept it and welcome it, live in the freedom that it gives us uh, to be who we are and to uh, grow into the person that we want to be and that God wants us to be. For freedom, Christ has set you free, says Paul to the Galatians, stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So this, this day has been about freedom. And I, um, so that's about all I have to say to you. <laughs> yeah, that's enough from me. And um, I think maybe uh, in this next uh, little break, we'll take another short break. And in this next little break, you can give some thought to relationships that you've been in. Have you been in a relationship that feels like an unhealthy, clingy, possessive relationship that feels like uh, a disordered uh, relationship that feels like a love that is, that is possessive and clingy? Or, and conversely, have you felt in a relationship, uh, felt yourself in, found yourself in a relationship in which you feel free to be yourself? and you feel appreciated and loved just as you are. And you're able to appreciate the love the other person just as they are, in spite of all the things that might be irritating about him or her. But you recognize the kind of freedom that you, kind of joyful, free connection that allows you each to be your own self without trying to possess or control or manipulate or cling to the other in an unhealthy way. So do some reflecting on your own relationships and see what you can discover uh, about them. If you've had an experience of an unhealthy relationship, you, you can learn from that. And if you've had the joy of a relationship and freedom, you can learn from that as well. So take a few minutes, and then we'll we'll close with a prayer, and uh, and we'll be finished. Thank you for your excellent questions. There's some really good questions here. One of them, the first one is, uh, how do you get the head knowledge that God loves you into your felt experience in the core of your being? And I think that's an excellent question. And my experience of listening to many people is that we, we gladly affirm that God is love and that God loves us. But when it comes right down to us, many of us are not quite that certain that God uh, really loves us. <laughs> and so it remains kind of head knowledge and not uh, a kind of knowledge that has taken over our hearts and really shaped our identity. Um, it's a good question. I think um, I alluded before to the verse from 1 John where it says, we love because God first loved us. We become people of love once we've received the love of God ourselves and we can pass it on to others. And how do we receive that love? And I think part of that uh, receiving that love is the work of prayer. Um, in prayer, we open our hearts to receive that love. Uh, for some of us, um, we think because of our weaknesses, our sins, our failures, uh, we don't deserve that love. But uh, God reassures us that it's not about deserving. God's love is not a love that we have to earn. And uh, what would be the standard for earning it? How could you be good enough to deserve God's love? It's a free gift given to all of us. Um, it, it would be hopeless to try to earn it, to try to prove to God that we were somehow deserving of this love. It's a free gift. 
given to all of us just as we are. And um, so to appreciate that gift, I think in prayer to open yourself to the possibility of a God who not only loves you, but who likes you, <laughs> who looks upon you with pleasure, who appreciates you, who smiles at you, who uh, says, I just love the little quirks about this person. And I love the way that she cares about this and, the, and how tender he is toward this person, how sensitive he is in this kind of situation. I just, there's so many things about this person that I appreciate. Imagine some of the things that God might appreciate about you. Today, it's a beautiful day in Cambridge. It's sunny and it's glorious out there. I don't know what it's like in your neighborhood, but uh, for some reason, you've chosen to remain indoors and to look at a video screen for three solid hours with somebody talking at you. And I suspect it's because you love God and you want to draw closer to God. And I think that God appreciates that. So can you, in your prayer today, open your heart to hear God say to you, thank you for setting apart that time for making the sacrifice of trying to open your mind and heart to uh, draw closer to me and to, uh, to learn how to love uh, as I love. I think God wants regularly to offer us thanks, but most of us say, oh my goodness, God can't thank me. I have to thank God. You know, I, I can't be there. And we have a hard time with that. Just like Peter had a hard time with Jesus washing his feet. Ah, don't do that to me. I'm not worthy. Of it. We push away God's love instead of receiving it. So listen to God speaking to you. You know the thing I like about you. <laughs> and you know how terrific you are about it. And you know, I watched you the other day. I was, I was so moved by how you but listen to God speaking to you those kinds of words of love. And let go of any sense that you somehow have to deserve this love. It's not something you can earn. Another question is, can can I speak to the difference between liking someone or their behavior as opposed to loving the person? I feel we are called to love everyone, but not necessarily like or approve of their behavior. I agree with you. <laughs> yes. Uh, loving someone does not mean necessarily approving of their behavior. Um, uh, if a parent shows love to an unruly teenager by setting clear boundaries and limits and by rewarding appropriate behavior and discouraging inappropriate behavior. Sometimes it's called tough love. Uh, so love doesn't mean, uh, yes, you can say anything, do anything, you can offend me in any way you want. I'm still going to feel great about you. That doesn't mean that. And there is a separation. But it means that I'm committed to try to try to stay with you and to try to understand what might be going on for you, why you act the way you do, the say the things that you do. I want to, I want to love you into a better place. I think God loves us in that way too. Said, yeah, this part I don't really think is the best, you know, but I still love you and I want to work with you to, to bring you to even a greater place of integration and health and happiness and joy. Um, so yes, there, we can distinguish between someone's behavior and between loving them. Yeah. How to let go of an unhealthy relationship and not keep coming back? This is a, a tricky one uh, because I think I think there are relationships 
that uh, become so unhealthy that we have to break them off, that we have to establish clear boundaries in order to protect ourselves from someone who is uh, toxic or damaging to us. I think uh, someone who finds themselves in an abusive relationship needs to insist that the, that the abusive behavior stop. And if it doesn't stop, they need to uh, leave or find the help that they need to get out of this relationship that is uh, so damaging. It doesn't mean they've stopped loving. And uh, it just means that they recognize that this relationship is particularly toxic and that it's appropriate to set up boundaries. Now, under what circumstances will I see or interact with this person? And maybe that means that I won't see or interact with that person for some time and maybe for time eternal, all of my life, I, I don't feel I can be in relationship with this person. Those boundaries can be very healthy and, and necessary, but it doesn't stop us loving that person, praying for that person, um, caring about what happens to them. It just means that uh, we have to protect our ourselves and it's it's loving uh, gandhi said you know if there's a man if there's a madman in the village he has to be stopped <laughs> so even gandhi who was a proponent of nonviolence, said you have to stop someone who's inflicting harm you have the harm has to stop and in this case too the abuse has to stop you cannot uh, just say, well, I, I love him so much, I'm going to stay in this relationship and allow him to continue to abuse. You're not doing anyone any favors, and that's not real love. Um, so sometimes love says enough is enough. There, there are limits to, to what behaviors I can tolerate. So at times it's important to let go of an unhealthy relationship and to say this relationship is not healthy for me or for the other person. And it would be better if we ended it. And it would be better for me to keep distance and not to come back to it. And that's perfectly all right. Um, that can be a wise and healthy move. Um, as, this is a, kind of a difficult one. As I don't have a lot of experience in this area. Someone has asked a question as a sufferer of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I noticed that I may have a disordered attachment with physical safety and slash perceived insecurity. How do I discern what needs real action and which to let go? Um, I think that um, I don't think that a concern for your physical safety and uh, 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 a worry about your perceived insecurity um, are necessarily bad things. Those are good things. So uh, I don't uh, assume that your wanting or needing physical safety is a sign of a disordered attachment. It sounds like a perfectly appropriate thing to want and desire. What I'm talking about when I'm talking about disordered attachments are things that are unhealthy, that are skewed, um, relationships that are possessive and clingy, or when we take something and make it the center of our lives, the exclusion of everything else and make it a God, make it an idol. And they say, this, I need this above everything else. Personal safety is one of the things that all of us need, just as food and shelter and companionship are things that all of us need. To want those things and need those things are not necessarily a sign of disorder and attachment. But what I'm talking about is a is an inordinate attachment to those things, an unhealthy attachment that 
uh, uh, clings and possesses and that is threatened uh, by the loss of this thing or uh, makes it so much at the center of my life that God gets crowded out and that I become um, held captive by this thing that I think I need in order to be happy or fulfilled. So it's 12 o'clock, I can hear the Angelus ringing upstairs. So that means, uh, the, the bell means it's over. Um, uh, and uh, so I thank you again for um, coming to join us today um, and to being part of this, um, this workshop. I'd like to close with uh, a prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. And then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you today. Remember the words of Sister Mary Tricky. If you really want to be happy, nobody can stop you. <laughs> enjoy the day. Enjoy your life. Find the freedom and joy that God means for you to have. So long, everyone. And uh, blessings on all of you.